Uh, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour on WPPM and on Philly Cam TV. I'm Vanessa Maria, and I'm here with Lukman Abdullah. Uh, we're talking about community organizing, working with youth, re-entry, um, and much more. So stay with us. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with all of that. Thirty-four years ago, I was falsely accused of taking the life of the person who took my little brother's life. After 23 and a half years incarcer- incarcerated, five years in solitary confinement, being abused by the uh, Army Reservist Charles Grainer, who was accused of abusing Iraqi prisoners in uh, Iraq, tried to murder me and a few other individuals in solitary confinement at SCI Green. However, through studying the law, I received a new trial and was found not guilty and released after 23 and a half years. While I was incarcerated, I received my GED. I took a distant learning course and received my bachelor's degree. And since I've been home, I received my master's degree. Uh, 34, I say 45 days after I was released, I received a job as a family preservation social worker working under contract with the Department of Human Services. 15 days later, I received another job, a full-time job working at night at Gardenzia DRC. And I worked those jobs for quite a few years. Then I transitioned to the Institute for Community Justice and was working in the prisons as a prison care outreach worker for them. And from there, I transitioned to the school district working as a a former parent coordinator, then family engagement liaison. You know, a lot of people wonder, well, you know, how have you endured all these years? And I have to say that I have to give credit to the higher power, but also through my reading and studying and studying psychology, studying the mind has helped me to transform and make a difference in my thinking so that I can be an asset in society, you know. And so I give my life to serving the community. That's an incredible story. And we're glad to hear that you were given a new trial, a new life, a second chance. And, and look at everything you're doing. So congratulations on the master's degree and, and all the incredible work that you've been doing in the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the things you said in the video that you participated in with Philly Cam and the reentry uh, reporting collaborative um, was that uh, self-development is the key the key to community development. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's such a big part of your story. Yes. Well, I I believe that, you know, as young people, we really don't understand, you know, what our goals are, what our purpose is in life. A lot of times we don't understand how valuable we are. And I believe that an individual has to do introspection and find out what's good about them, what are their goals, what are their desires, and begin to develop a blueprint or map for their lives that's going to help them become successful and a positive, productive individual. I think that self-development is the basis for community development. You know, we build a lot of nice buildings, nice homes, beautiful communities I mean we do a lot to beautify our communities but if we have individuals that's in our community that have self-destructive minds and a mindset this destruct this destructive a lot of times those beautiful buildings and stuff that we build will be torn down and in order I believe that in order to change a lot of things that's in our communities a lot of our young people have to do introspection they have to be shown how valuable they are they have to be shown the power that they possess the greatness that they possess and they have to be guided in the right direction so that they can be those assets that we need those leaders that we need and so I'm a firm believer that everything starts with the mind if we're trying to change our community we're trying to change the individual we have to try to we have to change the way a person think and see the world and how they see themselves 
It can be really difficult for youth, especially if they are from a single parent home or they don't have the support that they need at home to develop that positive self-esteem and confidence. Um, how do you inspire, uh, you know, young people and, and people that, you know, are alone in this world to, to really take care of themselves and establish a mindset that's going to leave them on a positive path? Well, I know right now I'm working with an organization or I'm helping to develop an organization called Forget Me Not Youth Services. And we have a building at Broad in York where we just received a license to open up a residential treatment facility that could house 30 young people. And so we started providing life skills training, entrepreneurial training. We started doing career development, but we also have a support group. And what we did was just knocked on doors, passed out flyers, reached out to family members who we know, people who we know, and invited them to come to the space to see where we're at. We invited them to sit in some of the groups and the classes with the young people. However, when I walk through the community, I talk to young people. You know, sometimes young people think I'm crazy because I come up to them and start talking to them. But I believe that, one, a lot of times we don't we're not able to reach young people because we don't have relationships with them. And I believe this important for us to build relationships. Even if we see a young person on the street, that look like they're going through something. I think that we have as adults or older people or somebody who know better. I think we have the responsibility to extend ourselves to the young people. Also, I think that a lot of our organizations that we have in the community, we have to leave out of those four walls and we have to actually go into the community, walk through the community and build those relationships because a lot of times the young people and the parents don't know that those uh, organizations and businesses and programs exist because we're not doing the outreach. And so I think it's very important for us to do the outreach and really make connections because we know where some of the hot spots are in our communities. We know where our children are struggling at. You know, they do census, they collect data every year, or at least every five years. The police department, they collect data every week so they know where the hot spots are. And if we want to be bring about change, then we have to go outside those four walls and we have to go into the community and make those connections. Yeah, it's really important to know your neighbors, to talk to people. You know, somebody asked me, Recently in a survey, like where I got my news, I said, well, I talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> That's I right. said, a lot of them were coming to the radio station. They're, they're telling me the news. You know, people said social media. I said, well, those are all great. But, you know, the people on you, in your neighborhood can tell you what's going on better than a lot of these news sources. So that's really important. One of the things that I see a lot of youth struggle with is um, they have a desire to be employed. But there's not a lot of people hiring, um, especially in cities like Camden, you know, and there's limited transportation for them to go outside the city. And it becomes very difficult, especially if they have to care for younger brothers and sisters. And at the same time, it becomes very difficult to afford college or get scholarships. How do we help them? How do, how do we help these youth get employed? As you said, become entrepreneurs what are the opportunities for young people in this economy well that's a good question uh i know uh one uh, we have a program where we have a, a ceo class and we're teaching the young people about entrepreneurship but also we have connections with a couple businesses who make products and develop products and stuff and we take the young people out or we're going we're getting ready to take the young people out into the community to sell the merchandise we get ready to show them how to do vending we get in there set up some vending stands for them so that they can do vending and we became a work site for workforce development so we were able to get 40 young people jobs through although they were summer jobs we were able to get 40 young people employed through the summer job program however during the course of the months moving forward we're going to be reaching out to different businesses and stuff and ask them would they hire a young person you know because I think that one of the benefits is that you know for these businesses if they could there's like a job creation tax credit and if they you know establish a certain amount of jobs within the communities and stuff they get a tax credit 
you know, for some of the young people or for some of the people who have uh, previous records and stuff. They have what they call the federal bonding program. And I think that if we take this information to some of the employers to let them know that this is like a tax, this is like insurance coverage for your business, you know, it may influence more employers to uh, hire people. And I think the other thing is that people have to be ready for employment. Everybody is not ready for employment. You know, I know working with the reentry programs, we have a lot of people who come home and they say, that, oh, well, I don't have time for this. I don't want to do this resume stuff and that. But then when you assess them during the course of the conversation, you see that there's room for improvement. And so we have to be, we have to have the communication skills, we have to have people skills, you know, and we really have to be ready. And so we try to take the young people through a phase of training and then let them know this is the next step after you go through this training process. Can you talk about some success stories of youth that have been involved in these programs and maybe go on to do other things? Yes, I have a few people who have graduated from high school and went on to college. I have a few people who have actually started their careers and stuff. You know, uh, most times, you know, I know when I started working with the juvenile population, I know one of the greatest things was to see some of the young people come home and get jobs and get back in school. And I could think of quite a few individuals who have done that. But I think also... It's the information that we're relaying to the young people. It's how we're relaying the information to the young people. And are we getting the young people to buy into themselves? Because that's the first thing. Individuals have to buy into themselves. And I think that I, you know, enjoy working with a lot of young people because a lot of the young people haven't gotten so saturated into the madness that's out there in society. And I think that we have a great chance of, helping them make improvements and or not getting caught up in the system because there's a lot of intervention work going on but what about the prevention work and we see from the schools and stuff that a lot of our young people have some concerns a lot of them are dealing with trauma so how are we working to really support those young people so that they don't get caught up in the system and I think that you know I have to live every day with the fact of you know, my, my brother's situation and how I, I believe I played a part in his misguidance. And so it's important to try to keep the young people from getting caught up in this system, getting caught up in the street life, you know, and just showing them how valuable they are. And how important is the family element of this? Um, a lot of times therapists or, you know, behavioral psychologists go into the home to find out what's wrong with the child, but then they notice it's actually the parents that are providing some kind of environment that's not conducive to their well-being. And so when I was, uh, when I was a family preservation social worker, I had the responsibility. To, I had a caseload of about maybe five to ten uh, families, and I had the responsibility to go and visit my families every week at least two hours, two and a half hours per week. And so one of the things that I would do is I would do an assessment to see what's going on with the family through conversation and talking with the parents and stuff. And so instead of just going and sitting and just having general conversation, I used to all, I was to do life skills classes with the family, mostly with the parents, because I believe that if you give the child one set of skills, and those skills not being modeled at home, there could be some confusion and some conflict. So I think the family plays a great part in things that's going on within the household and within the community. So we have to take a holistic approach in dealing with the families. And when you make when you made mention of you know the behavioral health and stuff, I look at we have four different systems. We have the behavioral health system. We have the uh, child protective service system. We have the educational system. We have the juvenile justice system. And when we look at it, all four of those systems or institutions, they all, they all work with the same families. And so one of the things that I've been asking myself for at least the last year, are they at the table to see how they can collaborate to take a holistic approach to dealing with the families? You know, and if we take a more holistic approach to dealing with the families and recognizing that we have a lot of families who 
are dealing with trauma, you know, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's homelessness, whether it's uh, a family member incarcerated, or whether it's violence that's happening in the community, whether it's unemployment, a lack of food. You know, there's a number of things that a lot of our families are dealing with. And if we don't support and help them get out of the crisis situation that they're in, then we may still have an imbalance. And I'm not saying all families, but we do have a large percent of our families. I know where I grew up at, you know, we had a lot of dysfunction within our community, you know. Yeah, there was a study in Trenton that, you know, had these statistics where it was like, you know, 70% of, of youth in Trenton had experienced or witnessed some type of trauma, you know, and so there a lot a lot of them were experiencing PTSD. Um, do you think there's a lack of mental health resources for families here in Philadelphia, or is it just a lack of information to access those resources? Well, I think it, it could be a combination of both. I, I think that one... Uh, the the resources aren't getting to the communities the way they should or the families aren't being informed the way they should. And that's because a lot of times we have we are not doing the best of jobs as it relates to outreach. You know, when we look at a lot of our institutions, they're used to the people coming to them. But we have to get do get more exposure for the services that's being offered and we have to go out into the community. We have a lot of conferences that be scheduled around the city and around the country every year. But if I'm a parent who can't afford to attend the conference, then I won't be exposed to that information. But if we have those conferences right in the communities that we know that need the support the most, then that's more exposure that the families will receive. Because I know a lot of times I carry information in my little book bag when I have my little book bag. And I carry information about, I didn't bring it today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I carry information about a lot of programs and services within the community so that, you know, when I come in contact with people, I can pass the resources. Yeah, it's always good to have flyers and information handy. We deal with that here at Philly Cam. Mm -hmm. You know, try to let people know that we're also... Uh, a resource for the community. Um, do you find yourself telling your story uh, to a lot of the young people that you meet, or do you try to keep it professional? Like, how do, how do you relate to them or really try to show that you're for real? Because I think a lot of young people sometimes, especially looking at a guy in a suit, you know, did not like really trusting them. <laughs> yes. So anytime I'm before young people, it, it depends on the setting and the environment. But most times I tell my story to young people and I tell my story to let them know that we all make mistakes. You know, sometimes we make mistakes or we're accused of stuff that we may not have done. But all of us have a story and we all have a struggle. But is do we allow our story and our struggle to determine the outcome of our lives? You know, and I tell them from the standpoint that, hey, look, this is what happened to me. This is where I was growing up because I can't I'm not going to try to just play the victim role because I believe that my growing up and my uh, my uh, uh, wrong decisions or being influenced, following the wrong people played a part. Karma played a part in what happened to me. So I don't take the victim role, but I just, I try to uh, inspire the young people to let them know no matter what your struggles are, you still have to push forward and try to make improvement on your life. You know? Yeah. I, I, tell, I tell them if you can stay in school, I wish I would have stayed in school, but I also understood that you need an education in this society, you know? And so I went back to school and did what I needed to do. Is school for everybody? No, school is not for everybody. You know, I didn't think I would get to, I didn't think I would get to be having a master's degree, but you have some young people who may benefit from a trade. You may have some young people who may benefit from starting their own business, you know, because we have a lot of millionaires and billionaires that didn't go to college, you know, sure but, they, <laughs> but they had a vision. And so, yes, I tell my sport, I tell my story to the young people because they need to know, you know, what the struggles are and what other people's struggles are. And I think this society, we live in a society where people are afraid to let people know 
the struggles that they're dealing with. We have a lot of family members who are afraid to say, well, my child is incarcerated for X, Y, and Z. You know, when we go into a lot of our religious institutions, people are afraid to talk. People are hurting. We have uh, Dr. True Lear wrote a book called The Healing Community. And our communities need to heal. But we have to be, you know, we have to have that support to when, when it comes to talking about the struggles and the issues, you know, and I let the young people know that, hey, look, you, 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 you can if you need somebody to talk to somebody to provide some resources for you. I'm here to do it because I know a lot of our young people have family members who are incarcerated. I was just talking to a young lady yesterday in our group. She said her dad been in jail for 30 years. For 30 years. You know, well, she wasn't younger. She was an older person, but, you know, for 30 years, you know. And we have so many children whose parents have been incarcerated for years, and but they're afraid to talk about it. You know, the parents sometimes, the other parent is afraid to talk about it. But I think that my story need to be heard. I think it need to be heard. And since I've been home, I've actually traveled quite a few places telling my story, you know, because people don't believe that. I know people didn't believe that, oh, you had prisoners being abused right here in Pennsylvania. And then we had Charles Grainer had to go to Iraq for the news to come out that he's an abuser. And then through the investigation, they found out that he was abusing us right here in Pennsylvania. You know, and so people need to know. And I'm a firm believer that sometimes people make mistakes and people make mistakes People should have the opportunity to, you know, uh, recover or, you know, uh, uh, make amends for the mistakes that they have made. And so I believe that individuals who go into prison, I think that they should be still they should still be treated as human beings. If I'm an officer of law or the law, I took an oath that says I'm going to uphold the law. So irregardless of my personal beliefs and feelings, I shouldn't be abusing another human being, you know, but. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're telling your story today. Was there a turning point um, during the time where you were incarcerated that you thought like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to I'm going to, you know, get my GED. I'm going to get out. Um, was there a moment or, or were you sort of thinking that? you know, the entire time you were there? Well, I know when I was, <laughs> before I was uh, convicted, my mother would come and visit me and she would, you know, say, the lawyer said, you know, you should take a deal for life or you may get the death penalty. I told my mother that I'd rather go on death row than plead guilty to something I didn't do and take a life sentence. And my mother came to see me at least about three or four times saying the same thing. And I was frustrated because I thought the lawyer responsibility was to try to represent me and find the truth to the matter to help me, you know, get justice. And so after going through the court proceedings and stuff, getting found guilty and receiving a life sentence, I was very angry. I was very angry. I was very upset. You know, I was, uh, I was, you know, thinking of a lot of destructive things. And so I was in Pittsburgh and I ran into a guy. Well, right before that, my sister, she brought my nephew up. I had never seen him before. And this little guy put his hands up on the glass because I was in solitary confinement. So the visits were through glass. My nephew put his hands up on the window and was smiling and laughing like he knew me all his life. He was one years old, like he knew me. It's the first time he ever saw me. And at that point, I said, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here and be a part of this young guy's life. Because at the time, I didn't have children. And so I went back. After a couple months, they transferred me to uh, Pittsburgh. And I ran into a young guy who, similar, he had a life sentence. He was falsely accused and given a life sentence. And him and I had a conversation, and he was like, you know, we need to start going to the law library and try to do what we can to get out of here. And so him and I 
every day would go to the law library and we discovered some things that would help us get back into court and stuff. And it was at that point where I was like, you know, everything I do, I have to do it with the mind frame that I have to be an asset into society and not a liability. And I said that I need to give my life to helping other people, you know, being an example, being a role model, you know, not misleading individuals, but staying the course and showing them the right direction that they need to be on. There's sometimes people frown on me and they say, oh, you, we, you this, you that. I'm like, no, I value life. And so I recognize through all that struggle, the value that I possess, you know, the information that I possess that can really help somebody else who may be going through something. Because I hear a lot of people talking about their issues and stuff. And sometimes I sit back and I say to myself, if you only knew, you know, so I work diligently just to try to be an example and, you know, be a role model for the for the young people, because at the end of the day, I don't want to be the cause of misleading another young person like I misled my little brother. Well, I, I really love that, that you were able to turn it around and that you got inspired by looking at that baby and his smiling face. And hopefully, you know, your nephew's still around and yeah. <laughs> you can laugh with him in real life. Um, we're going to take a short break. If you're just tuning in, we're lis- uh, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour on WPPM and on Philly Cam TV. I'm Vanessa Maria, and I'm here with Lukman Abdullah. Uh, we're talking about community organizing, working with youth, reentry, um, and much more. So stay with us. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with all of that. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour on WPPM and on Philly Cam TV. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and today I'm joined in the studio with special guest, Lukman Abdullah. He is a community advocate. He works with youth and people and reentry. He's been doing lots of really, really great work to empower people here in Philadelphia, make their lives better, get them on track. And we've been talking about his own experience uh, being incarcerated, then being vindicated and released, and then going on to do a lot of really great work in the community. So thanks again for telling your story. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the things that really plagues Philadelphia and especially you know, communities like North Philly and Southwest Philadelphia 
And that is the incredible amount of violence that people are experiencing. Many of the times it's at the hands of um, drug-related violence or domestic violence. But either way, the community, whether they're directly um, experience it or not is is affected. Mm. Can you talk about some of the work that you do um, around violence prevention, and what are some of the things that people could be doing or, or should be doing? I feel myself sometimes rather powerless to stop the shootings and the murders that are happening each week in our city. Mm. So I say one. I think that it's important for the people in our community who consider themselves as advocates or activists, uh, people who are having, running uh, community-based organizations. I think, one, it's important for them to come together and really collaborate and develop a strategic plan or outline in relation to preventing the violence. And I say prevention because there's always going to be some uh, percent of individuals who just don't get it. It just hasn't clicked. But I think that a lot of the organizations have to come together and begin to develop in projects and different programs within the community. Because I'm a firm believer that if you take 15 to 20 men and you go into a community and you start doing some type of programming and stuff with young people in the community, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, one, most of the guys represent most of the guys respect uniforms they respect numbers and they respect unity and i say this because i remember a few years ago i was uh going through i was leaving my mother and my former mother-in-law's house and i saw about eight guys on the corner and i knew the guys you know sold drugs and did a whole lot of things but i saw them acting like they was boxing and when i was looking at them i was like they don't even know how to throw a punch and so as I was driving down the street, I hollered out the car and was telling one of them, you know, how to hold his hands and how to throw a punch. And they looked at me and laughed. So I pulled my car over, went up to them, showed them how to hold their hands, how to throw a jab, you know, how to stand, how to move. And during the time of me talking to them, I was asking them, do they work? Do they want to work? And by the time I was done, I had four young guys ask me, could I help them get a job? And to me, that was a good percentage, you know, to show that they wanted to do something positive, you know. And I and that comes to trying to establish relationships. The sad thing is that we watch a lot of young people grow up in our communities, and we're afraid of these young people now, you know. And I, I'll say for just cause, you know, for just cause. But I think that it's important for the men to really step up, come together. And show the young people a different way or a better way. And so I said I do. One of the things I do is when I recognize a group of young people or I'll give you an example, the schools. When I go into the schools and I see young people who are dealing with some issues and stuff, I recognize that these young people are going to be the next leaders. These young people are going to be the next young people who may go through that prison system. And so what I try to do within the schools is I try to start support groups with these young people to give them the information that's going to help them improve on their lives. And I'm a, I'm a big advocate of improving on your life, giving the tools and the resources. A lot of our young people have poor social skills. They have poor problem-solving skills, and they have poor cognitive development skills. And so most of our young people don't recognize the risky situations that they find themselves in, you know, and just being able to get them to understand and, and, and know of the risk, you know. So we do it at Forget Me Not. I do it at the schools. I just take every opportunity I can. And then I also carry resources with me. People laugh at me because I have this uh, piece of paper that on the piece of paper it says, in this mirror. And people say, well, what does that mean? I said, when I do my little groups and my little talk sessions with young people, the first thing I ask them is, when you wake up in the morning, what do you see when you look in that mirror? And then when I ask them that, they'll say, I see me. And I say, well, who is me? 
and then they'll say their name. And then I say, who is that? And so we'll go back and forth talking about me, me, my name, me, my name. And that's because a lot of times they haven't really dug deep inside of themselves to find out who they really are, what skills they have, what values they have, what they want to do in the future within their lives and stuff. And when you start bringing out some of that stuff with a lot of these young people, subconsciously you give them something to think about, you know. And those that's just some of the stuff I work with different organizations in the city to try to bring them to the table. The sad thing about Philadelphia is most of the organizations want to be recognized by their own independent identity. And so it's hard for us to do joint venture collaborations because everybody want to be the lead and everybody want to be up front. While at the same time, we still have young people dying every day on the streets in our communities, you know. And so we play a major part in the problem because we're not coming together as a unified force to bring about change. But also we, we recognize that our young people want money. Most of our young people want money. And money is a great influencer. So if we have 10, 15 organizations in the city who have a great budget. Why can't we put together some form of uh, a money-making project and recruit more young people and put some money in their pockets, teach them how to save, teach them how to invest, you know, teach them how to start their own businesses where they can make good, honest money, you know. And it's going to take, they, people always talk about it takes a village. But we're not operating as a village. we operating as individuals. And we're more uh, reactionary than being proactive. If we go into any community in our city, if we go into any school in our city, we know the individuals who are of concern, of greatest concern. How do we approach them, you know, is the question I ask a lot of the groups. How do we approach them? You know, what are we coming to them with that's going to redirect them, you know? And for the most part, when we look in our communities, most of the young people have no fear because most of the community is indoors. And I, I, I charge a lot of the men in the community. You know, as men, we have a responsibility to be on the forefront and try to bring about change, you know? We have a lot of men, unfortunately, who are misguiding the young people, you know. So we have a responsibility to recognize the damage that we're doing. You know, as long as these young people see that the men aren't stepping up and trying to bring about a change. And when I say step up, I'm not saying step up and knocking them in the head and you ain't doing it. No, but giving them another way of doing things, guiding them in another direction, pulling our resources together so that we can put together a strategy to bring about change. If they see that we have, I'm, and I always say this, if our young people see that we have 10, 15, 20 men with the same shirt on, same pants, same hat on, working in the community with different projects with a group of young people, and every day we move closer and closer to where they at, and we say, can we get this space so we can teach the young people? Most of these young guys have little brothers and little sisters. And I know that they don't want their little brothers and little sisters in harm's way. So when they see you working with their little brothers and little sisters, they're going to be like, oh, that's Mr. Abdullah, that's Mr. John, that's Miss Marie. They, they working with the children. Before you know it, you'll have them off the block on another block. And if we have a group doing that, before you know it, they'll be saying, can we get involved? What can we do to help? And just by them being engaged and using their talent in a positive way, it can influence a whole lot of these young people. Because I've, I've talked to them, and they always say, nobody talked to us. Years ago, I used to work with an organization called uh, Me Productions, and they had a, a project called uh, Blueprint for a Safer Philadelphia. And I remember when they used to take anywhere from 75 to 100 young people in the community on Friday for two hours, Saturday for two hours, and Sundays for two hours. And all they do is pass out violence prevention information. And it was amazing how people would follow them 
and ask who are you and ask how they can get involved, you know. And they gave the young people a $10 stipend per hour. And so with all the money that we blow in this city and all the money that's being blown on nonsense, why can't we have more organizations pull our resources together, give these young people a stipend to work on different projects like that, you know. We got to put the egos aside. <laughs> that's for everybody, right? Yes, you ma'am. Know? Yep. I think uh, that's the key is, you know, looking beyond yourself. Mm-hmm. Once you've improved yourself, of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, in- inspiring others and, and, and like you said, working more like a village and a tribe. Yes. I want to talk um, before we end um, about your work uh, co-founding the Human Rights Coalition, Mm -hmm. a really important organization here in Philadelphia, operates out of the lava space on Lancaster Avenue. Um, And and the work is important because it really advocates for people who are incarcerated and and advocates that they have access to communication and visits Mm -hmm. with their family. Talk about how that happened got started and yeah. and some of the work that's that's been done since yeah. it was established. So the Human Rights Coalition was a vision of one uh, political prisoner, Russell Maroon Schultz. And through his guidance, because political prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz is an uh, educator. I mean, he was in solitary confinement for over 20-something years, close to 30 years. But what he did was he established educational programs right in the hole, in, in the RHU, where he had us studying the whole map of the United States. We could run off all the countries, the continents, everything, you know, and we had different educational programming. But at the same time, Individuals were being abused. Russell Maroon Schultz also wanted to focus on some things that could be done to save some of the youth. And so through the discussion with different individuals who were in solitary confinement, the concept of the Human Rights Coalition came about. And so he wanted to bring about uh, prisoners, prisoners' family members, and even families who have been victimized and stuff. He wanted to try to develop a system where he could bring everybody together to work for justice, to work for change, to work to minimize and to stop the abuse that was going on in the prisons because he recognized that when you damage a person even more while they're there, what are the chances of them getting better? Because people become more bitter and more angry if they're being abused while they're in prison. And so for those that's being released, they may be released without the right mindset, you know. And so his fight was, look, we need somebody to monitor these people who took an oath to uphold the law, but they're breaking the law every day. And so the Human Rights Coalition been advocating for uh, the stop of the abuse the stop of long-term solitary confinement because, you know, you housing a person in a, in a room no bigger than the bathroom for 20 years, 30 years, 40-something years, that's inhumane. We don't even keep our dogs in a cage that long. We let our dogs out, you know, to run around and have some freedom to stretch their legs. You know, you have a person in that cell... 23 hours a day with freezing cold air blowing on them, 24 hours a day. You know, I mean, it's inhumane. So Human Rights Coalition been advocating for change as it relates to, you know, long-term solitary confinement. The Human Rights Coalition been advocating for, you know, the release of juvenile uh, lifers. The Human Rights, we just had a, uh, we just did a panel discussion down at the uh, convention center where we actually brought, uh, parents of those incarcerated, formerly incarcerated individuals and mothers who've lost children to violence on the streets. We brought them all together to have a discussion about, you know, how can we work together to bring about change within our communities and stuff? Because all families are victimized, whether a person is accused of doing a crime or the person who was affected by the crime. We all are victims and we all suffer from trauma. You know, and we all have to heal as a community. So I've been engaged with the Human Rights Coalition from the beginning. Although I don't make the meetings like I should, I'm there when they need me because I think that it's important 
uh, that we work to bring about a change, you know, especially when we have loved ones who is going to come home one day and we want them to be in the right state of mind so they could be a benefit to the community. But we also, you know, working to try to really bridge that gap and even work to support the family members who have been victimized because, you know, the family members are hurting too, you know. Mothers in Charge is an organization of mothers who have lost children to violence on the streets of Philadelphia. The founding member, Dorothy Johnson Spider, is my cousin. And so I've been working with them to, you know, bring about change and try to prevent some of the violence that's going on in the streets because it's nothing like being in a room and hearing 20 mothers talk about their story of losing their child, you know. And so that has been a driving force for me also to stay engaged in doing the work about change, you know. And it's so important to hear from them because often the way the news is reported is the victim is nameless, there's no investigation, there's no suspects, and that's it. You don't hear the story evermore. And yet there's a family, there's a community connected to that individual who doesn't forget. Even if there is no trial or suspect convicted, they live with that. And and also families who have um, individuals that are incarcerated often are, are punished too in a lot of ways with the high cost of of communicating with them on the phones. Um, and, you know, there was a victory uh, two years ago where they were able to cap the prison uh, phone call rates. And now they're trying to undo that again, which is, again, you know, you're punishing the families mm-hmm. when you're going through that. Although one of the positive things we did see is the Supreme Court ruled that the juvenile offenders who had been sentenced to life should be resentenced or retried. So now we're seeing a lot of people being released as well. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, having that family support when you come out is, is really crucial because in these cases you could be released at any time. Yes. Yes. And I've been uh, working with a couple of juvenile lifers who have come home. And one of them I actually grew up with, And from childhood, you know, he came home after 36 years. Uh, I mean, it's important that as a community, we try to, you know, support them to make sure that they're on the right track. They have what they need because we're talking about some young people, some individuals who went went to prison for something that, you know, happened in the child state of mind. You know, and some of these young people, some of them that I've met thus far, some of them that I know, I mean, they're some of the most brilliant individuals. You know, they're some of the most uh, uh, knowledgeable individuals, and a lot of them have their mind on straight. They want to do, you know, what's right. They want to stay on track. But I also know that they need support. You know, I was at uh, uh, the Rotunda a few weeks ago, and one of the gentlemen he had he was incarcerated 34 years i mean 43 years as a juvenile lifer and as he was speaking i was thinking to myself how many family members do he have still around to support him you know and if so are they willing to support him you know because after being away for so long there's a a, a gap and a disconnect between you and your family You know, even I know for the short period of time I was away, I know that there was a distance, you know, there was a divide between me and my family. And there's a they had to really get to know me all over again, you know, although they tried to act like they wasn't affected. I knew they was affected, you know, and right now today, you know, (laughs) a couple of my siblings, we still trying to get to know each other again, you know, because of the distance, you know. One of my sisters told me that you're never going to get out of prison. And here I pop up, you know. And so there's a healing. There's also a healing process because even some of our family members become angry when we're in there. You know, they be they become angry because of what we might have done, what we may have not done. You know, we uh, 
put ourselves in a situation where we can't provide the support for the family or be a part of that family uh, system. You know, so a lot of things take place. You know, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and all kinds of our families go through it, too. Our families go through it, too. And so there's a healing process all across the board. One of the things that I'm, you know, wondering is what are we going to do as a city to make sure that these 300 or so people who were sentenced as juvenile lifers is due to come back to Philadelphia? What are we going to do as a city to prepare for their return? You know, how are we going to help them? with their mental state of being? How are we gonna help them with their housing? How are we gonna help them with their economical situation? How are we gonna help them, you know, get on track or get back on track? You know, because we have some of them that's sharp as a whip, but we have some that don't have the support that they need. And so are we gonna fail them or are we gonna set up systems to support them? When we talk about housing, we have so many abandoned houses in the city of Philadelphia. There's 40,000 vacant lots and abandoned homes in oh the city. Oh, my goodness. You've been doing your research. And so why can't, you know, we establish, you know, a housing facility to house these people, to help them for those who need housing, you know? And I know we all say, well, my taxes, I don't know my taxes, I don't know that. I think that as a community, we're never going to get away from the fact that there's always going to be crime. Even the people who we don't expect to commit crimes commit crimes. The person in the suit commit crimes. The person in political office is accused of committing crimes. As we see, you know, with, with Seth Williams, you know, a lot yeah. of people did not think he would plead guilty, but you're right, everybody. Yeah, yeah. and so the thing is, is that, you know, do we discard a person who get caught up in the system or do we try to provide supports because at the end of the day irregardless of what we may think what we may believe if individuals are coming back to our community we should be working collectively to set up systems so that they don't get caught back up in the system you know because we all have a role to play in bringing about change in our communities so one person may be an educator, one person may be a mentor, one person may be a housing developer, one people, one person may be a tradesman or a tradeswoman, you know, and if we come together and pro provide some type of supportive services for individuals, that may be the one thing that make an individual say, you know what, I'm going to fly right and stay on the right track. It could turn out to be another Lukman Abdullah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you for being on our show. Uh, can you tell our listeners and our on our viewers on TV how they might get in contact with you or find more information about the work that you do? Yes, they could get in contact with me by calling me 267-902-3866 or by emailing me, BTS. Leadership Foundations with a S at gmail.com. And I'm always at uh, 2321 North Broad Street, right off of Broad in York at Forget Me Not Youth Services. All right. Well, there you go. Again, that email address is BTS Leadership Foundations at gmail.com. I want to thank our guest, Lukman Abdullah, who is doing really excellent work and has an incredible story. Thank you so much for telling it. Thank you for having me. And thank you for inspiring us, you know, to do more in our community, to help one another and make it better. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing at Philly Cam, because I'm also a member of Philly Cam, too. That's right. <laughs> telling stories here, putting the good word out. So I'm Vanessa Maria Graber. You've been watching and listening to the People Power Lunch Hour. If you want to check out this episode again and all of our past episodes of the People Power Lunch Hour, you can visit our website at phillycam.org. That's going to do it for this episode. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>